Yeah, man. Well, you know, what's funny is funny is not the right word, but what's interesting to me is that I think, you know, somebody who's worked with men exclusively, I've been in ministry for over 12, 13 years now. Um, but exclusively working with men, the last six of those years and without fail, majority of men would say I've struggled with pornography in some way, shape or form. I heard a statistic once totally fake, but 99% of men admit to struggling with pornography. 1% lie. Um, so every, basically every man has been touched by yeah. this subject in some way. And yet it's one of the least talked about subjects in the church. And so obviously you just wrote a book about it, but I'd love to hear your heart. Why, what, what made you dive into this topic? Yeah. Yeah. Porn has become like the wallpaper of our culture. When we're not looking at porn, porn is comes and looks for us. Mm -hmm. We have to make up our minds. We have to decide which way we're going to go. What finally helped me when I realized that porn is not really about sex. Porn is the total denial of everything we respect, everything we desire, everything we revere, everything we're living for, everything that we find life enriching and life giving. Mm. Porn is Satan's big play to destroy, I mean, it destroys sexuality, but that's just for starters. Yeah. I mean, he's playing for all the marbles and he knows that this very personal area of life, this very glorious, our sexuality, our God created sexuality is magnificent. Mm -hmm. And I think Satan, he's the ultimate sort of puritanical prude Hmm. He hates humanness. He hmm. hates physicality. He doesn't have a body. Hmm. The word became flesh. His worst nightmare became like us. Hmm. His arch enemy, whom he fears and hates, came into this world through a woman. Hmm. Satan hates and fears women and does all he can to bring them down and degrade them, demean them, demoralize them, oppress them, and so forth. And when we men click into online porn, here's what I think we need to realize we're doing. We think of it as just a sort of a sidebar, kind of self-indulgent. We're not proud of it, but we're not horrified by it either. Right. It's this sidebar self-indulgence. There's not a lot of consequence involved and nobody's really getting hurt and so forth. That's not true. Hmm. It is the total denial of everything we really believe in. It will destroy our futures. But here's where, we're, where we really are when we go to a porn website or even linger over something pornographic that leaps up at us. Yeah. We're standing at a doorway into this big room. And in, the, in this semi-darkened room, there are sofas and mattresses and beds and carpeted floor space and so forth. And women and girls all over the place who are being, I guess the nice language is taken advantage of. They're being right. used. They're right. being humiliated. They're being demeaned. And they have to play act like they like it. Like right think if this is fun, because if they don't play act well, they will be more tormented by their owners and users. And so all this is happening in this room. And, and here, I'm a Christian guy. I walk, I'm standing in the doorway looking at all this, and I'm looking around the room for the decent option, because I'm a Christian guy, mm. and I don't want to go for the really awful stuff. So what I should be doing is turning up the lights and rescuing the victims and mm. call police for crying out loud. Mm. Now, that's where we are in relation to porn. And God has called us men and God has empowered us men as his men, his image bearers, to be liberators, mm. rescuers, abolitionists, heroes for humaneness. Right. A man of God must, M-U-S-T, never be predatory, mm. but always 
sacrificial hmm. because not, and we, we feel that way, Jared, not because, you know, we don't want to be like those bad guys over there. That's just smug self-righteousness. We feel that way because God created us glorious. God created every man glorious with a high and holy calling. God created every woman and girl glorious in his image. It says here in, in uh, Genesis chapter 1, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, who isn't inside that verse? Right. Everybody, male and female. So I guess what I'm feeling so deeply and longing for, Jared, is that every guy reading this book, The Death of Porn, will rediscover how magnificent he is, that God has put something of God's own glory on every man. This book is not, it doesn't scold or belittle men. Yeah. I want to look every guy in the eye and tell him again that he is royalty. Mm. See, when it says God created man in his own image, that word image elsewhere in the Old Testament is used of like a statue. Mm. Now, we're not literal statues of God because he doesn't have a shape. Um, but uh, one of the commentaries on Genesis I have up in my library puts it this way. It says, when a great emperor has a, a, a kingdom, a domain so vast that there are parts of his kingdom that he doesn't often visit himself personally. So what he does is he puts up statues of himself there mm. to declare his royal claim. Mm. We are in the image of God. We are representations of God's royalty here in this world. We are to represent God's kingdom, bring God's kingdom. And his kingdom is a kingdom of, of liberation yeah. and yeah. dignity. And his kingdom puts spring in our step and sparkle in our eye and steel in our spine. I want that for every single guy. And uh, what if a whole generation of men, Jared, the guys that you're serving and caring for and investing in, I thank you for that. What if a whole generation of men rediscovers their royalty? Yeah. And they stand up straight and tall yeah. and say, okay, by God's grace, for his glory, I'm going to make a difference with my life. Yeah. I'm not going to settle for compromises with oppression. I am going to reach for breakthroughs to liberation. Yeah. We can do that. Man, there's so much. I feel like you just uh, poured out a wave of wisdom on me that I'm, that I'm trying to unpack in my head in the moment. There's so much that you said there that I want to kind of tease out. Okay. One, of the thing, one of the things you said at the beginning which I wanted to write down and I didn't. And now I'm going to, so I'm going to butcher, I'm not going to quote you well, but you, you kept saying something to the effect of it goes, what did you say? You, you've said it twice. It's something to the effect of it goes against everything that we, yeah. we hate or what did, what did you say? At the, well, porn represents itself to us. The, the surface sort of play acting that it's, uh, it says, this is about sex. Yeah. This is about turbocharging your sexual experience and right. this is about fantasizing and going places in your imagination, you, you're not going to go in your actual life. Right. It's really going to be fun. We got to see through that, Jared. The reality is take that, that mask off. And what there is there is the demonic denial of everything we care about. That's what you were saying. Yeah. So unpack that phrase. I've never heard that phrase in context of this conversation. So let's unpack that phrase. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> okay, if I were Satan, and I've known some people who, who might have considered that a possibility. <laughs> if I had to work out a game plan to bring down not just Ray Ortland, but this whole generation. Yeah. I'm old school. And I'm thinking down in hell, there's a great big warehouse. I don't think in terms of computers. I think of metal file cabinets. Right. Okay. And little folders. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I got a few of those because my wife loves to collect papers. I keep telling her you can do it all digitally. But anyway, yes. So 
if if I were the devil and I'm working on a game plan to bring down Ray Ortland and you, Jared, and every man listening in on our conversation, and I've got a file on every guy. Mm-hmm. There's a file down there with my name on it. There's a file there with your name on it. What would that game plan look like? Well, it would surely include our sexuality. Yeah. Because not just because, Jared, it's an intense part of our experience of life, and it is that, but it's one of the most glorious gifts of God himself. Mm -hmm. But what I would do as Satan, because I'm not stupid, is that I would trick it out, I would clothe it and costume my game plan as something really fun. Hmm. Or at least a kind of outlet pressure valve when life is hard. Yeah. I mean, a lot of ways you could sort of pitch it. But the one thing I wouldn't do is admit to the truth of it. Right. I wouldn't show that. And it would be only too late when porn starts taking us to places we never thought we would go. Right. And we can't slow this down. We can't stop. Something is taking over inside. The, the darkness is, is getting more and more traction, more and more momentum, and it's accelerating. And I can't find the break. I don't know how to stop this anymore. Yeah. Only then would it occur to me, this is going to destroy everything I care about. Yeah. And that's when Satan's got us. Yeah. And the only, Jared, what we got to do, it's not like we're going to go um, outsmart Satan, but what we can do, I don't believe we overcome our worst sins by heroic willpower. That's right. We overcome our worst sins by honest confession to mm. others. Hmm. You, uh, man, I have so many thoughts on this. Okay, let's just hang there for a minute before I go backwards. Honest confession to others. Yeah. A lot of guys are going to feel like they're hearing that and their heart just sank because it's like, can't, can't there be a better way? <laughs> can, can we do it some other way that we can, we can find healing here? And you're saying healing is going to come from, or at least the start of healing is going to come from honest confession, confession to others. And a lot of guys will be like, well, can't I just confess to God? Confess to God a million times. So when confessing to others, what does that look like? Is it, do I need to go to a church and confess to a pastor? Do I need to find a friend that I just randomly bring up this awkward conversation? Do I need to confess to my wife? Cause I feel like that's going to destroy our marriage. What does it look like to wow. honest confess? Yeah. Thank you, Jared. What a great question. Well, fortunately the Bible uh, addresses this directly. James chapter five, verse 16. Therefore confess your sins to one another should we confess to God? Yes. But I'll just speak personally. It's confessing to God alone is too easy. Mm -hmm. I can lie to God even as I confess to God. Mm. That's how tricky I am inside. Mm. So the Bible says, confess your sins, plural, not your generality sinful condition, but specific, like last Tuesday night. Yeah. Confess your sins to one another. By the way, that's mutual. It's not like one guy is in the middle of the room and everybody's pointing the finger at him and humility. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No, no. Here's my mess. And the other guy says, and here's my mess. Yes. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. That's step one. Step two, and pray for one another. Yeah. Step three, that you may be healed. Yes. Healing comes down wherever confession comes out. Mm. And was up. So I'm sitting, I'm thinking one of some guy who's uh, listening to us right now, Jared here, I would say to that guy, number one, thank you for the privilege of serving you through this podcast. Thank you for listening in. Here's my recommendation. As soon as this podcast is over, don't wait 24 hours. As soon as this podcast is over, call or text the the christian guy that you most trust and most respect in your city and say to him can we get together in the next day or two hmm. and can we meet for coffee um because i've got some things i need help with and i need to open up with you about some mess in my life and um and i i need a brother to pray for me so 
And, and what the other guy will say is, of course, if he has any sense at all, and if he is a trustworthy brother, he will say, well, not only will I make that a priority, I'm, I need to tell you the mess in my life. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask next is what's the proper response when a brother confesses to yeah. you? Respond. Oh, yeah. Here's what isn't the proper response. I mean, there's so ways, so many ways <laughs> that it's wrong. Advise him, fix him, quote scripture at him, condescend to him. There's so many ways to get it wrong. All you, all you say is, okay, so he pours it out. I think the proper response is, thank you. Thank you for leveling with me. I feel so trusted. I feel yeah. so honored and respected. What a privilege. Something like that. Yeah. And I like what you said that, and then, then I would actually confess my sin back to him, that there's a mutual confessing of sins to each other and there's yeah. healing that's happening in that. So the other, other guy can say, okay, now that we've gone there and we, we we're on, we're in a safe place here together and we're going to keep this between ourselves. Yeah. So here's my mess. And then I recommend if you're not in a public place <clears throat> where you can, if you're by yourselves, get down on your knees. And one guy pray for the other and the other right. guy for the, the first. Just, and when I go to a brother, as I often do, and say, I've got some things I need to confess to you. He knows. I mean, it's so humiliating. Yeah. It's like dying a million deaths to put out in front of another yes. brother. Because this false self I've been projecting, yes. it has to die. Mm -hmm. And my real self comes out. And so when he prays for me, the prayer I need is not shallow and glib. It's like, Father, my dear brother is in trouble here. Yeah. He really needs help, and so do I. We're crying out to you. Yeah. You'll come save us, yeah. clean us up, whatever it takes. You know, that kind of desperate prayer. Hey, that's when the healing starts coming down. Yeah. I mean, that just I get I on I get emotional just thinking about that's kingdom work happening. Big time. Man, if we had men who were brave enough and humble enough to do like I just imagine two men praying over each other desperately. I'm not here to fix you, man. I'm not here to, I don't even know if I've got all the advice, but I'm going to pray the spirit of God over you. And you're going to pray it over me. Dude, that's his kingdom work happening. That's, that's spiritual leadership. And uh, you know, I, I often times I say this to you guys, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this in reference to that verse in James, confess your sins to one another, pray for one another that you might be healed. One thing I always say is when we confess our sins to God, there's forgiveness, right? As we, as it says in Romans, when we confess our sins to Christ, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us. So there's forgiveness that happens. So when it comes to just like shame, like, am I forgiven? Am I even a Christian? I've been looking at porn. I, I don't really know. Well, first the spirit of God is convicting you. So you should already be resting in that. The fact that his spirit is working in you is evidence that, that you are saved and God is working in you. Right. But there's forgiveness that has happened, but healing comes from that scenario that you just you just painted for us brothers confessing sins to each other, praying over. It. And that's where the healing happens. Forgiveness has happened on the cross. Healing is happening. And, th and it's a gift of healing that God has given us to confess to each other that we might be healed. Would you, what do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, that is really well said, Jared. That's really well mm -hmm. said. Thank you for that. And the healing, I wrote this book, the death of porn, because I want I want millions of men in our generation to, to find out how good it feels to get healing. Yes. Yes. I want that. Instead of this quiet little uh, kind of low-grade fever of shame, kind of sap yes. of life, I want them no to know how great it feels for healing to start entering in. Yep. And not only that, Jared, man, here's how crazy I'm praying. What if 10 years from now, some of the most compelling preachers of the gospel are ex-porn stars. Mm. What if some of the most generous philanthropists are ex-porn website investors? Mm. If some of the best, uh, most effective apologists mm. for the gospel are ex-porn videographers and so forth. I mean, Jared, what if 
10 years from now, because we Christian guys start feeling, experiencing healing and it goes viral. Yeah. What if it reaches even into the porn industry itself? Yeah. Wow. I wrote this book because should we be playing defense? Yes, but we can also play offense. Yeah. And it's about time we did that. I love that, man, because I, what I love is that you're calling guys to something more instead of just saying it, what accountability groups have and this, you know, I'm going to confess to you and I'm going to meet you on Tuesdays and kind of, we're going to be an accountability group. What often happens there is it's just behavior modification checkups yeah. and I'm going to come to you and you're going to, and it, and it usually is. And I love that you said this. It's usually one way I grew up in the church setting where a youth pastor or a youth leader or mentor said, Hey, we're going to meet on every, every Tuesday at Starbucks. Now we're in an awkward public place. And he's going to ask me, did you look at porn this weekend? It's like, well, oh, geez, do I really want to say this? And you know, at Starbucks and do I really want to, it was one way it was always one directional. So there's lots of shame that just comes and even just the way that you've set up the relationship, but it, at the, at the core of it was just, I'm checking in on your behavior. There was never any heart. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to press in, in your heart and, I'm not calling you to more. I'm not seeing. And I just love the fact that you are calling guys to more. Not only is it, we're not just doing this because it's wrong. We're doing this because there's image bearers of Christ involved here. And we are trying to redeem what God has put. I, I love that. What did you, how did you, you're glorious. Is that how you said it earlier? Man, that, that God has created men to be glorious. Like there's a warrior, a beautiful warrior inside of a man. And you're called not to just not do the wrong thing, but to step up into, like you just said, play offense. I love that, man. I love that you're calling guys to more. I don't even use the category accountability because I've seen that used in my own experience. I've seen that used in a coercive way. Yeah. Me too. But I love the category transparency. Yeah. Because that's mutual. Yeah. And uh, I, I wouldn't want a gospel relationship to become leverage for power. A gospel relationship is when we all go down to the low place together. Yeah. Because that's where Jesus is in yep. the low place. Yeah. It's hard to admit this because it's, it's so, to me, so moving and powerful and glorious. I wrote this book because the women on porn websites, they have no idea how glorious they really are. Mm. How did they end up there? They ended up there by being mistreated, yeah. demeaned, humiliated, abused. There's no high school girl anywhere. I'm going to, I'll bet you five American dollars who's thinking my life goal is to end up on a porn website. Right. That's what I really want. Right. So they get there, they get beaten into it. But that woman is glorious in the sight of God. That woman yes. is precious in the sight of God. And a Christian man, something happened when he realizes that, according to scripture. Yeah. When his heart changes toward that woman and he becomes, his heart breaks for her. Yeah. His heart advocates for her. He wants to be a big brother to her, to defend her yes. and care for her and bring her in as a member of the family at the dinner table, as a friend, as a precious neighbor and so forth. What if a whole generation of men discover how powerful it is to be a Christian brother yeah. to women who've been mistreated, they deserve to be treated morally. Yes. God thinks so. We are men of God. Okay. Now we know what to do. Yeah. Yeah, man. I love it. I, you know, I just, I want to say we have a, what's called a family leadership program where guys come in and they actually spend a good chunk of time really doing self-assessments on figuring out who they are as a man, what's going on inside of them as a man, and then as a father, as a husband, and as a worker. And I actually, we have seen this, that that mutual confessing of sins to one another. I've seen it in, in deep and powerful ways. And so as you share that, as you paint that picture, I think one of the reasons I get emotional is because I can, I can picture guys' names in my head who have mm. been doing this. 
and yeah. to, and to see the healing that they're starting to experience as a result. And so I'm telling that to the, our listeners who are, man, if you're like, I don't even know who I would call. I don't know. Like, you know, if I, I want to confess, but I don't even know who I would call right now. Just know every month we have a cohort of guys who are taking this stuff seriously. And one of the things we do is we have them, is it, is, are you a man who's struggling with this and you need to confess to a brother? And there's that mutual confessing. It's not, I'm a pastor and you're going to share it to me. And now it's kind of awkward because you see my wife, you know, but there's like this brothers who are saying, I'm, I'm here with you, man. I'm like-minded and let's confess to each other so that we can see healing and be the men God's called us to be. Oh, gosh. Jared, I'm so thankful for what you're doing. Mm. Every guy that heard, just heard you say that, let me just um, back you up and, and say to that, that listener, uh, again, thank you for even sharing this time together with us two, Jared and me, and do get in touch with Jared and his organization. What a tremendous resource. Man, Jared, what if over the next 10 years, we see authentic awakening and revival in two places in our culture, in small groups of men yeah. all over the country yeah. and inside the porn industry. Yeah, I love it. Oh my goodness. If that were happening two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, more and more, I think we could stop worrying about Washington. Yeah. And because our whole focus would shift, we would see God, the Holy Spirit, it works so wonderfully. And Jared, because of what you're doing and so many other wonderful churches and ministries and organizations, what you're talking about, you're making that revival experience accessible and available to men. Hmm. What a sacred and glorious and powerful resource. Hmm. Yeah. Well, praise God. Praise God. I love what you're, man, I just, it's getting me fired up because I love the thought and I love what you just said. It's bigger than Washington, right? I'm all about, we need, you know, we need people to think through all that big stuff. And there's a lot of big stuff that needs to be addressed, but healing of a country, of a society, of a family, of a neighborhood is going to start with men. I believe this to my core men who are starting to experience healing in Christ themselves. And that when, when, when that happens, man, it just starts to flow out. Yeah. I'm getting excited. I mean, let's Jared, let's just say that for the sake of discussion, let's say to all the quote unquote, right candidates get voted in. Yeah. And we men never start confessing our sins yeah. and never pray for each other and don't experience healing nothing will change. That's right. It doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter. matter. What if we start, uh, excuse me for putting it this way. What if we start to vomit out mm -hmm. all the anguish within the regret, the shame, the agony that we feel inside the, re um, all these, you know, do overs we wish we could have, but we can't because they're just there. What if that just poured out of us? Yeah. And we gather with other uh, men we trust and respect, and we all share that together. We get down on our knees and cry out to God together. Can you imagine the risen Christ above saying, no, I think I'll get involved with that. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> oh, right. It would be awesome. And, and that experience of healing would not stop with just us. Yeah, Healing is the greatest power in the world today. Hmm. Light is stronger than darkness. Yeah. Life is stronger than death. Healing is stronger than, than sickness. And it would just move out in all directions. And God would do amazing things with us. Yeah. yeah. And then we're raising sons and daughters and, and we get to see grandsons and granddaughter, you know, like that, that kind of well, the healing that your experience is going to start passing down from generation to generation, which also gets me really excited. One, one of the things I'm, I'm curious to your perspective on is I think that, you know, I worked in the church world a long time. And so I'm not naive. I'm now I'm still in full-time ministry. I work with a lot of church leaders. I'm just not naive to knowing what leaders, and I'm talking specifically now about Christian men in leadership who are struggling. And uh, these are conversations that they can't have publicly or and and finding even a guy to confess to because they're leading their church. I've sat in many circles. I've sat at many restaurants with guys who I know are in leadership and they've got high levels of leadership and they're struggling with this issue and they don't know where to go. And I know some of those guys are listening. 
uh, to this podcast, ministry leaders who feel uh, almost an I, well, shame is heavy regardless of who's bearing it, but they're carrying carrying a heavy weight of yes. shame on them, and they don't know where to go. They feel hopeless. Yeah, that isolation and loneliness and fear; those are powerful forces. Yeah, but what makes them strong is the feeling like I have to save face, I have to keep my job, yeah, I have to keep up appearances. Yep. That is bondage. I, I would just say gently and candidly to that dear man listening who's, who's right there. You are so significant in the sight of God that your integrity matters to God immeasurably more than your job security. Yes. Yes. Your marriage, your credibility, your soul your deepest happiness. That is what God cares about the most. And, uh, and if you follow the Lord into even the loss of your ministry position on your way to recovering integrity, the Lord will provide for you. The, mm -hmm. Lord, will care for you. the Lord will be so committed to you and your, to your redemption. But if if we hang on to a false appearance, if we keep projecting a false self, how can God support that with his blessing? Yeah. It will not end well. Yeah. So what if, why don't we just admit the truth? Yeah. Start taking bold, humble, courageous steps toward recovering integrity at any cost. Yeah. Any guy who does that, Jared, it will be painful. It will be costly. At times it will be humiliating. But that man who is willing to follow Christ into reality and authenticity and integrity, that man will end up with, that's when his ministry will finally begin. Yeah, I agree. I agree. He'll end up with something significant to say. Yeah. But keeping up appearances, I mean, that is really scary. Yeah. If, if, if fear is powerful, then let's fear the Lord. Hmm. Hmm. How much of this, uh, you know, so we talked about confessing to another brother for all the guys, that, a lot of guys who are listening are married and a lot of weight, they sh the, a lot of the, the weight of the shame that they feel is knowing that they're, how much it would break their wife's heart. What would you say? Uh, is appropriate to let your wife in on this conversation? How do you have that conversation? When you're confessing to your brother, is this like this between us? Or what do you yeah. tell a guy? That's a really delicate question, I think, Jared. Thank you for asking it. I don't really have a good answer because it's so personal. Mm. Every marriage is its own mini world. Yeah. And with the, those two people there, I would say a lot of guys probably should be cautious hmm. about confessing this to uh, their wife, not because they want to falsify themselves yeah. in their marriage, but only because they might be aware that would be so devastating to my wife. Yeah. It would so take the heart out of her. It might actually jeopardize our marriage. Hmm. And, um, and I, I'm not sure that would be a wise move. But going to uh, just total naked honesty and transparency with a trustworthy, mature Christian brother who will walk with you through total loss of face, yeah. tell him everything, and pray with you, healing begins to come down. It might take a while because... It is healing doesn't really start until the last most, the, the best guarded secret is finally unveiled. Mm. That's the tipping point. Wow. And to go there with a guy might take time and your wife might not be able to walk there with you, but there are guys who will. And then maybe down the road uh, when you're in a better place and you know what would really be awesome, Jared, is if a wife were to say to 
her husband. It's like you're back. Mm. I feel so loved. You're, you're energized again. Yeah. You're attentive again. Yeah. yeah. Something has really wonderful has happened. And that could begin a conversation that might eventuate in that kind of disclosure. In a real marriage, it probably should go there eventually. Mm -hmm. But you have to be realistic about what your wife can take. I, uh, I really appreciate that answer. And, um, you know, I think it's important to, I'll just say it to the listener who's listening right now. And th these guys who have listened to the Dad Tire podcast for a long time know that I love them and I'm in their corner and I'm your champion. But I would just say as a follow-up to that, it has to be one or the other because it is destroying your marriage. So if you think I'm not going to confess to her because it might destroy our marriage or could be the detriment of our marriage, dude, you, you being addicted to porn is going to be a detriment to your marriage. So if you're not going to confess to your wife, which maybe you shouldn't, because it, it might not be the right time, you have to find a brother to confess this to because death is happening at some level, regardless, uh, if you're confessing it to your wife or not, she is still experiencing the death of your relationship in some way. And so uh, what leadership for you looks like as a listener who's struggling with this is you got to be committed then if you're not going to confess it to your wife, then go find a brother and confess it so that you can find healing and give yeah. your wife the kind of relationship that she's longing for. Jared, that's so insightful. And I want to say to the guy who's listening, who is involved with porn, what you might not be able to see right now is that 10 years from now, you're going to be divorced. Mm. And 20 years from now, your kids will not respect you. Oh, man. And 30 years from now, you're not even going to be sure that you believe in God anymore. Wow. And it doesn't have to happen. Wow. 10 years from now and 20 years from now and 30 years from now, your life can be immeasurably glorious. You can have that. God wants to give it to you. Go get it. It's yours in Christ. Wow. And, and this first step is James 5.16. And, and shameless plug, Jared, I wrote please. this. Yeah, please. The death of porn. Um, because I want to help a whole generation of guys experience their true glory. I don't want them divorced and alienated from their kids and confused in, the, in their own souls. I don't want that. It doesn't have to happen. I'm hacked off about that. I'm, this is... Let's run a new play right now and let's start gaining yardage going the opposite direction. Ray, I hope you don't take offense to this question. May I ask how old you are? <laughs> <laughs> no, man. Uh, I'm 71 years old. 71. So I, uh, in many ways, I feel like a lot of our listeners, you could be our dad uh, as far as age wise. And we, uh, many of us did not have dads to speak that kind of truth and love to us. And so I just want to say how much I appreciate that. It's one thing to hear from me. I'm up here. I'm stumbling my way forward, in, but I'm, I'm a rookie at this whole dad, husband, disciple thing. But from a, to hear it from a man like you, it really, um, there is a sense of, and I, and I feel like this, uh, uh, even to, I don't want to over-spiritualize, but I don't want to under-spiritualize. I do feel like there's kind of almost a supernatural, a father you know, a sage in the faith speaking to a younger generation. It is just, no, I receive that personally as a man. And I think there are a lot of us young guys listening who can't thank you enough for, for loving us, even in this moment and shepherding us in truth and love. Cause it means a lot to us for guys who didn't have it and oh. don't have it. Jared, I can't tell you how meaningful it is to me to have this significant conversation with you and with the guys that are listening. I feel so privileged to be allowed into your world and allowed into what you care about so much, what you're giving your very life to. Mm -hmm. And um, so if this is a, if this is a win for you, then I'm happy. So it's a privilege. Huge win. It's a huge win. And I, I think I just love, man, I, you just, your heart is just really hitting things that I haven't been able to articulate very clearly, but things that I really resonate with. And that's that it's so much deeper. Anybody can say you shouldn't look at porn. It's not good. You could go to a completely secular space and people would say that it's not helping your marriage. It's not helping the community. It's not helping the women involved in this. We all know that, but there's so much, there's so much more that God is calling you to. 
And it's that picture that you just painted that imagine your marriage 10 years from now, your parenting 20 years from now, your legacy 30, 40, 50 years from now, that's what's at stake here. And it's not just, we're trying to, you know, get rid of this bad habit. We're trying to live a life that's healed men, healed guys who have experienced the goodness and grace of Jesus. And we're passing it down to generation to generation. That's kingdom legacy stuff, man. It's way bigger than just kicking a bad habit. So thank you so much for, for calling us to more. What you've just said, Jared, I deeply believe in that. Yeah. Big high five, man. Thank you yeah. so much. Well, I'm going to tell all of our listeners, I know you, you've mentioned it a few times, but please, everyone go pick up a copy of this book and leave a review on Amazon. <laughs> uh, I know as a fellow author, how helpful that is to get some good reviews and to just keep the momentum going. It just helps it get in the hands of more guys, all the digital algorithms that happen. So I want everyone to go buy your book and, uh, and as it points you to Jesus, man, just leave a review and let everyone know. But Ray, thank you, brother. It's, it's been so, so good for me to talk to you. And I think you're, you're going to help a lot of guys. I've deeply enjoyed this, Jared. Thank you for the privilege.